Welcome to the Attitudes Podcast. This podcast is the brainchild of Attitude Foundation and Northcott to chat about attitudes about disability. In 2021, the University of Melbourne published a nationwide survey on Australia's attitudes on disability, which will be the focal point of our season one. I'm your host, Angel Dixon. I'm a person with disability. I dedicate my time to furthering the inclusion of people with disability. I'm a model and the former CEO of Attitude Foundation. In an effort to bring life to the numbers in the survey, each week I'll be joined by current and former board members and one friend of Attitude Foundation to discuss one of the survey's findings. Today I'm joined by Todd Winter and we'll be discussing the topic that 63% of people agreed that people with disability are easy to take advantage of or exploit. Welcome Todd. My name is Todd Winter. I'm coming to you today not too far from you, Angel. I'm in Brisbane and I'm on Yigara land, so I'd like to pay my respects to the Indigenous elders past, present and emerging on this land that I recognise was not ceded. And Todd, can you give us a little bit of your, your blurb? I mean, you have quite a long bio, but I'd love to, for you to share some of the interesting things you've been part of. First and foremost, I am a political academic. I've had a background in teaching a variety of political subjects, both in disability policy, but also in public policy in a multiple, a multiple universities in Queensland. I've worked for a number of NDIS providers, particularly in the accommodation space with um, providing expertise and support of uh, helping people with severe physical disabilities to um, receive the funding that they're entitled to outside of the NDIS. But my primary role at the moment is as an NDIS consultant and subject matter specialist. So I help train providers um, to demonstrate what is best practice and to keep them up to date with the latest news and trends and the political culture of the NDIS. I'm the self-appointed political nerd of a very smart, very bright, very talented team that I work with. That's quite an intro and um, I love your self-appointed title there. <laughs> um, I have to say I'm I'm really excited about the potential for our conversation today. You've chosen a topic from the Attitude Matters survey that is something we haven't addressed yet in these chats. And the topic you've chosen is 63% of people agreed that people with disability are easier to take advantage of or exploit. And there are so many things that you have been part of that you continue to be part of that I know put you in the right place to discuss this particular point. And I'd love to start off with just your view, your viewpoint of this topic. Well, the reason that I chose this topic, primarily because it is super topical. We're recording this episode just a mere few weeks after the Royal Commission report on the abuse, neglect, exploitation and mistreatment of uh, people with disabilities. It's such a long title that no doubt I've got some of the adjectives mixed up, but you've got the general idea. We've had an entire Royal Commission about this very topic. Um, uh, we've had a few weeks to, well, I've had a few weeks to digest the bits of the report that I'm interested in. And as a person with a disability, who has a profound physical disability of spastic quadriplegia, cerebral palsy, it made confronting reading and a lot of the reasons why it was confronting reading was it highlighted the ways that people with disabilities can be exploited. So it's a really fascinating topic that I'm looking forward to discussing with you today. So let's dive into that report and let's talk about all those ways that people with disability can be exploited. Well, when people tend to think of exploitation, they go to the nth degree about maybe it's physical harm or compromising people's safety. But 
let's just peel it back. The key thing of the Royal Commission report is, in fact, that the some of the reasons why people become exploited is because they don't know what their rights are. And that's my that's my passion in all areas of life. It's why I became a political animal because I acknowledge that as a person with a disability, I don't have access to rights. And I as a student of political history, um, my favourite political quote is by former President Lyndon Johnson, and he says, power is where power goes. So I wanted to be where the power was because I'm at a disadvantage being a person with a disability. And what the report actually says is, if people with disabilities don't know what their rights are, don't know where the power is, do not have the opportunity, whether it be through their impairment, their circumstances, the lack of support in their life and other challenges. If they don't have the opportunity to know where that power is, they're not going to know how to access their rights. And if they don't know how to access their rights, the climate is rife for opportunities of exploitation. I could sit and listen to you for hours, Todd. Um, I wonder if we could have, if we could break that down further to the daily instances and what not having access to those rights means. Um, for even you, do you have any personal stories that you can draw on? Yes, there are, there are personal stories every single day. There are literally hundreds of stories because... They're deaf and we teach little kids about what disability is. And most people define my disability as being powered, my powered wheelchair and my inability to walk. But the social model of disability teaches us that the disability is not just about my impairment. It's about society's attitude towards impairment. One of the reasons why the Attitude Foundation exists is because we want to operate in the social model. And so if the problem is with the society, what does that say about disability? Disability isn't about the fact that I can't walk. Disability is about the lack of choice I have in my life. So some very basic examples are I don't get to choose when I get up in the morning. I don't choose when I eat. I don't choose when I shower. I don't choose when I dress. People both who have disabilities and don't have disabilities fail to recognise that we make hundreds of choices a day, the majority of which aren't mine. And I'm very lucky on the scale of disability I can articulate these things. I have the intelligence to articulate these things. I have a, a stupendously great support network with a family who loves me and who cares for me. And I have great friends. But other people with disabilities haven't got those opportunities. And when they haven't got those support networks and when they haven't got those opportunities, the lack of choice is amplified to the nth degree to the point where if we're saying disability is a lack of choice and you're already limited by the choices that you have and they're limited even further, you're going to grab every opportunity to make a choice that you can. And often at times that can be in very vulnerable places or very vulnerable situations. I would love to talk a bit about how did you come to this place of understanding your own rights? I have two very fierce advocates, my parents, who didn't accept the, the conventional traditional diagnosis of my cerebral palsy. I'm quoting my mother here when I say at eight months old, the doctor told my parents to try and have another baby and throw me in an institution. 
and cook me a vegetable. And if I had another set of parents, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. So just by defying that convention, by saying we want to take our child home anyway, and by the fact that they're both educators. My dad was a high school principal and a teacher for 40 years. My mum was a teacher for, you know, 30 years. So they taught me the value of social justice, the value for advocating for yourself. For example, one of the first lessons I remember them teaching me was, you are disabled. You are going to need a lot of help. So one, you need to know how to articulate that help that you need. But two, you need to be polite, you need to be courteous, you need to be helpful because if you're demeaning or rude to another person when you're asking them for help, they're not going to want to help you and you're going to be in trouble because then then you won't get the help that you need. Which is an unfortunate conundrum for a lot of people with disability. In fact, I only spoke about with Emma, our other board member in our last chat about how people with disability take so many hits every day, particularly when we're talking about the medical model of disability and the way that we're perceived predominantly. And so every day when we're encountered by these barriers and these perceptions, you get angry. (laughs) You get uncomfortable, you get angry, you're frustrated that you have to do this all day, every day, every minute. And so to try and stay as poised and calm and respond to people politely is a challenge in itself. If you talk to my wife, she might disagree that I respond politely and calmly, but I'm I'm very... I'm very feisty when I want to be, particularly if the issues concerned are political because I know what it's like to not have a voice. I didn't talk until I was almost five. And even the little bits that I remember, I, I remember being being trapped in my body and not being able to express my thoughts and feelings and Even now, I remember that as a terrible, frustrating experience. So when I am silenced, I tend to go the other way and tend to roar like a lion and say, you you don't, you think I'm not going to say something? Well, I'll show you type of thing. Todd, even now while I'm listening to you recount that story and the way you felt being in your body, I'm thinking about this podcast being consumed by people with that predominant medical model narrative. And I wonder if you could speak more to how you felt and why you felt that way, because I 100% know that you're not coming at it from a medical model perspective. No, no. Well, society is geared and history is geared uh, to define us as people with disabilities that the problem is the problem is us that's what the the medical model says so even if you don't think that the problem is you you've got a whole bunch of people in society many of whom don't know the first thing about disability who come up to you in public and say oh it's good that you're you're doing the grocery shopping, for example, or you're going to the post office. And that lack of expectation, what former uh, disability commissioner and founder, I think, of the Attitude Foundation, Graham Inniscalf, the soft burden of low expectations. You can't actually feel worthy if Everybody else in society is saying you are different, you are less than because you you have an impairment. So it's only natural that you're going to take on this ableism and internalize it. So it's a battle in itself when society defines you as a human as the very thing that separates you 
from the majority of society and that separation isn't viewed as a positive or worthy characteristic. In fact, it's viewed as the opposite, something to fix, something to remedy, something that should be repaired. And isn't that saying something that even as a child younger than five years old, you had taken that on to that level? That's, yeah, that's <laughs> speaks exactly to, I guess, the problem, doesn't it? Yeah, because it, it's, it's biological. I mean, you know, it's survival, the, survival of the fittest take out the weakest of the herd and, the, you know, the weakest as easily perceived by a society of those who are physically different, even if we're conscious of those thoughts or not. And so, Ty, going back to this statistic, I'll remind everyone, 63% of people agreed that people with disability are easier to take advantage of or exploit. I'd love to talk to you about the NDIS and your involvement in, uh, I guess, appropriate funding. Um, you mentioned accommodation earlier. That has a huge role to play in choice and control. Um, all of these things are so intertwined. What what can you say about all that? The, the common misconception, particularly for those who don't have disabilities, is that N the NDIS is meant to solve all of the problems related to the disability sector is meant to take us beyond society. It's meant to take us on an equal footing and, you know, help us to project beyond. Uh, that might be the intent in theory, but it was never going to be that way in practice. When the NDIS works well, that allows me and other people who use that is funding to have equity of opportunity. I choose those words carefully because I don't believe in equality because if I have access to the same resources with a physical disability, equality is saying that everybody has the right to equal opportunity. Equal opportunity is not going to work for me because of the environment around me. I need equity, so I need extra help to get the same opportunities as everyone. So the NDIS is an equity program. It doesn't take us beyond where we should be. The NDIS allows us to function daily. So we, sh we should have already been there in the first place. Everybody treats the NDIS as revolutionary. And in many ways it is, particularly where we come from, segregation, isolation, services for us, not with us. But the NDIS has only equaled the playing field. There is so much more to do. Now, hopefully, the majority of us have access to basic services, and that's a big if. What's next is being able to put forward a contribution now that we have the same equity as everybody else. I mean, before the NDIS, many people I know with physical disabilities didn't shower every day. They only showered twice a week, and we've had the fight to shower every day. And if even some of, some of the people who aren't getting the funding they need for whatever reason are still fighting these battles to get what every other person with a disability takes for granted. The NDIS levels the playing field. It doesn't mean the playing field is over. It's not finished. It will never be finished. And so when we're thinking of exploitation and taking advantage and the Royal Commission and the NDIS, what are some of those stories? What are some of those examples? So the, the Royal Commission report basically says that we're still making up lost ground because of the culture of ex, uh, segregation and isolation. The challenge is 
We've got the legal frameworks in place, like the Disability Discrimination Act, like parts of the NDIS, parts that are meant to oversee how those services are provided, parts that are designed to pre prevent discrimination. But unfortunately, many people with disabilities don't know that these tools exist or when they're put into development, those frameworks require skills and expertise to navigate around. So if you have a framework, but you don't know how to use the framework, what good is it? So basically what the Royal Commission was saying is, yes, we've got these frameworks in place from the outside point of view, so we're we're saying we're doing the right things, but when the most vulnerable people can't access their rights because either they don't know they exist or they're too complex to enable, then we have a problem, and it's sort of a second level problem. We've we saw we've sorted in quotation marks. The first problem, the first step is to have the rights. The second step is what are you actually going to do with those rights? It's been really challenging over the last, you know, three years since the idea of the Royal Commission came up and since the hearings and the report and now the aftermath. The unfortunate thing that can happen is that we only see these barriers. We only hear about the severe experiences of, of people and it can be quite a downer. <laughs> so I'd love to hear your panacea. I'd love to hear what your utopia is for disability. How do we solve this problem, Todd? I expected you would you would predict my answer in saying there's no panacea, but the next step is its magical word, co-design. And lots of people actually throw it around and don't actually understand what the concept of co-design is. Many people think that co-design is providing feedback for a quality disability service. That's not co-design, that's good standard disability practice. Co-design is having people with disabilities around the decision-making table saying this this is our this is our future for the next three to five years. This is how we change the culture of society because it's not enough for the disability sector to know what the NDIS is, to know the issues of the Royal Commission. Where where's the public been with this? Why isn't the Prime Minister um made a statement saying that this Royal Commission is awful. We've had Bill Shorten, we've had Amanda Richworth as the responsible minister to make a statement, and those statements were valid and very good. But it's not enough to teach other people with disability. We have to change the culture around the values that we place on people with disabilities. That That's the next step. And that's actually a much tougher job than getting the NDIS in place. And there's this song in Hamilton that says, why do you assume you are the smartest person in the room? And that to me and that to my colleague is the non-disabled community telling us as people with disabilities that we're not the smartest person in the, in the room. So my, my goal, my mission, my life's work is twofold. Power is where power goes, so you've got to work out where the power is. The second thing is I want people with disabilities to be the smartest person in the room, whether that's at their NDIS reassessment meeting, whether that's at home, whether that's at a corporate board level, whether that's at the cabinet table, whether that's even at the launch. We've got to have power, but we've got to have the expertise 
on how we use that power. So we've got to stop thinking about people with disabilities just being in the room, and that's enough. We've got to make sure we're the smartest people in the room, that we can advocate for them and advocate for ourselves. One of the, the good points about how the NDI is instructed, besides its many structural flaws that we're still working through, is that we place the individual goals as the primary motivation for how we operate as disability services. That's a very deliberate, that's a very deliberate aim. And if we go back to the social model of what makes every person different? What, what makes each individual different as well as their disability different? So who, who knows what the smartest person in the room looks like for them? It might be having the ability to communicate what they want and what they need. It might be getting extra support for supported decision making. It might be opportunities for them to go out in the community. For many people with disability, it's going to vary according to what they want and what they need primarily, but also their level of impairment. So we've got to individualise it as well and say, what do you want out of life? Whether that's be, you know, be a powerful political advocate or whether it's to communicate effectively, the person needs to be asked first. That's the key thing. Yes, Jordan, I think that you have just summed everything up in a nice little neat package there right at the end. Um, so I think that's a natural place to finish. I really want to thank you for a really rich conversation today. It's a topic that I've really wanted to discuss with someone just like you who has the expertise and the lived experience and I feel very privileged to have had it with you today, so thank you. No worries, thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. This has been the Attitudes Podcast. If you'd like to learn more about the survey, visit the University of Melbourne website or head to the Attitude Foundation website for more information on us. This podcast wouldn't have been possible without Matt Field from the Attitude Foundation and Alex Farley from Northcott. Hosted by me, Angel Dixon, produced by Lucy Griffin, and edited by Simon McCulloch and Evan Munro-Smith.